Rocco Cabaretti Caterer. I'm convinced this is the most versatile commander ever. This is my third episode on him. You can check out the other two here. Rocco's been out, what, like a year? And there's already even more cool things to do with him. This guy's a lot more than a chef. The key is that Rocco's got three colors and you can tutor up any creature as long as you've paid a little bit extra. That sounds like a lot, but we do have green. And I think the theme for this one is a Boros attacking deck. There's a million amazing Boros creatures that have fantastic attack triggers with some card advantage, and they've really been giving us a lot recently. I still don't think I want to brew a commander deck around any single one of them, but throw Rocco at the top. Now I can get whatever piece fits best in any given moment. Let's get to it. Let's look at the mostly Boros commanders we've got. And these are all still pretty recent. And I think most of these have come out since Rocco came out. So this is a new take. Let me tell you what I mean. One of the central figures of the deck will be Cadric Soul Kindler. So this is asking us to put more legendaries, which is perfect for Boros. And the fact that the legend rule doesn't apply, that's very nice. That is why these token creature versions are allowed to exist. And there's some pretty heavy duty effects. Let's look if we combine that with Duke Alder Ravenguard. This is at the beginning of the combat, so we'll give something haste in Myriad before we have to declare them at attackers. This is important because Myriad cares when you declare it as an attacker. It's kind of like it splits up into ghost versions and you attack everybody. The main one goes at whoever. But look how well that combos with Cadric. We make a copy of some legend. Duke Alder gives that thing Myriad. Now we've got a myriaded token copy swarm going at someone. We don't care if the first one dies because we're going to sack it anyway. We get major effects that way. Now factor in Commander Liara Porter. First of all, Commander Liara Porter makes all of our exiled spells cheaper regardless if it was happening through this ability. So this is great for all of those red effects that let us exile a card and until end of next turn you get to play it. We definitely want to add those things to a deck like this. We have to stack these triggers so that the Myriad goes first. In addition, Kami of Celebration came out. This is not a legendary, but this is a five mana spirit. This is another way for Commander Liara Porter to get more cards to cast with discounted value. Creatures have to be modified. I haven't talked about modifying creatures yet, but the Kami does put plus one plus one counters, which counts. I'm also thinking about equipment, which I'll get to in a bit. Wolfgar of Icewind Dale. This one's a little bit older, it's Forgotten Realms. So Commander Liara Porter, for example, we attack three people. Now that'll trigger twice. All of our cards cast from XL will be discounted by three and discounted by another three, and we will XL three, and we will XL another three. Six cards off the top, all being able to be cast for six less. And speaking of melee, why not throw on Adriana, Captain of the Guard? This is a much older one, much older. Other creatures you control have melee, so now everybody's getting plus three, plus three on attack. It's great. I know I wasn't fooling anybody because the whole thumbnail thing, the title of the episode, the intro, it's fun to pretend. Let's look at some more green creatures that are great for combat and some legendaries. More specifically in green, let's look at Durnan of the Yawning Portal. So it's already getting one cheaper for each opponent you have, not to mention if Liara Porter finds her way to the battlefield because of Rocco or something else. Now we're getting a huge discount on those creatures. Even Hajar Loyal Bodyguard, very cheap creature, just a red green legendary 3-3 three, three, fan fantastic card in a big combat -y deck, and the beauty is Rocco can grab him for just two extra mana. White, red, green for Rocco, and then two more for Hajar. If you want to dip into the Warhammer stuff, this one's actually only 17 cents according to Scryfall. Death Leaper Terror Weapon, and if you don't remember what Flesh Hooks does, creatures you control that enter the battlefield this turn have Double Strike, like all the tokens from Myriad. And I keep hinting that there's going to be some equipment angles coming up later on, and you can bet that there's plenty of equipment that gives haste that just makes Death Leaper fantastic. The best part about adding green to a Boros deck is the ramp and the card draw. But we also get green, so we can run your rampant growths to put more lands out. We can run Harrow to put even more lands out. Kessig Naturalists, not legendary. And whenever Kessig Naturalists attacks, you add red or green. You don't lose those till end of turn. Great. Grand Warlord Radas, kind of this ability but bigger. You get red or green for each creature that's attacking this turn. Maybe if we got some budget in the bank, we can afford a Selvala Heart of the Wild. That can be a ton of mana. Or just straight up, if you've got 20 bucks to drop on a Nyx Bloom Ancient. With stuff like this out, this is why Rocco needs the green, because we need to be able to pay for that extra tax. It's like any one of these creatures costs an extra three. You know, maybe you do a Shamanic Revelation for draw too. Like that's an important part of the deck. A bunch of draw and a bunch of life gain if need be. Life's Legacy is a nice one too. It's just one in a green. I like this in a green deck because it's a nice way to blank an opponent's removal spell. Oh, you spent a card to remove my thing? Well, I spent a card to also remove my thing, but also draw five cards. 
I don't want to have to send Rocco back to the command zone somehow to be able to get that X again to tutor up another creature. Teamer Sabertooth. A classic. A commander staple. It's fine to save Teamer Sabertooth from a wrath, and Teamer Sabertooth also saves Rocco from a wrath, or if you got nothing going on at the end of someone's turn, you can just put Rocco back in your hand with the intention of grabbing another person out of your deck. Iganjo Freeriders is a 4-mana creature with flying. It's 3-4. Another way to get Rocco back into our hand. And we've got a whole bunch of single white instants that can return a creature to our hand. They've actually given us quite a few of these. If you go back a little while, this was hard to do for one mana. But now we've got Alley Evasion, Light the Way. We've got You Are Ambushed on the Road. And then Shepherd of the Flock looks like a 2 mana 3 one, but we've got the Adventure side. And while I was looking for this effect, I encountered Scapegoat, which I probably talked about in an old Rocco episode, but I forgot about it. It seems pretty good. It's only a quarter, a gumball. This sounds like a pretty good way to get around a wrath. We may have to end up discarding things, but if you assume the wrath is being cast on your opponent's turn, we can cast Scapegoat, sack whomever we care about the least, and then return all of our key pieces to hand. I see no reason why you don't return all of them and then just discard whatever you have to at the end of your turn. We've got lots of legendaries, and we probably want some equipment. Most of this stuff has been legendaries so far, so something like Blackblade Reforged keeps getting better. It's also a gumball, but the creature gets plus one plus one for each land. And remember, we've got green, so we've probably got a ton of lands in play. And Blade of Selves, believe it or not, is down to 250. When this card came out, it was like 50 bucks. It's the kind of effect we probably want in the game. I do want to do a quick shout out to Kodama of the West Tree. And if we can somehow myriad this, we've got Kadrick so that the tokens don't have the legend rule. We're putting some equipment on things. Now, if an equipped creature deals combat damage and we've got three Kodamas on the battlefield, each one will let them tutor up a land. So now that we're into the equipment, I gotta mention Aster, Bearer of Blades. That's how we're gonna get around these brutal equips. Blade of Selves, equipping for one, yes. Blackblade Reforged, equipping for one to a legendary or non-legendary, incredible. And with Rocco, costs seven mana to pop Aster right onto the battlefield. I guess you'd need an eighth mana to do the equip for one. Sounds like a lot, but it's doable in green. We're going to include Brunor Battle Hammer. Maybe if you only got seven mana, this is who you find to do that first equip for free, and then you get Aster to do multiple equips and shuffle things around. Or maybe you don't even need to. I don't know. And then Cole the Forge Master. Another great way to get Rocco back into hand. We can put equipment on Rocco, and now if anything happens to him, as long as it's not exiled, Rocco comes back to hand. We don't even spend a card on it. Maybe this is what that life's legacy is for. We also get to draw cards. Creature tokens you control that are enchanted or equipped also get plus one plus one. Fine. More redundancy, more keeping stuff out of the graveyard is Hoffrey Ghost Forge. It's a great card. Keeps things going, you know? People wrath? Cool. I'm coming at you for a whole nother round. Where the millionaire's at? You want to talk about expensive cards? Oh, and if you are a millionaire and I have your attention, might I suggest you go over to patreon.com slash commandersbrew. Share the wealth. I gotta talk about another four mana Boros card. This one's a little bit older. This is from the original Theros, Iroas, God of Victory. $15 card. It is incredible to be able to just attack without a care in the world. Iroas does that. That's why it's 15 bucks. If that's too pricey, I'm a big fan of Loyal Unicorn. Loyal Unicorn is also a four mana card. The Unicorn is a trigger. So if you kill the Unicorn after this trigger is resolved, you'll get all of that stuff for one combat, which I guess cannot be said for Iroas. If Iroas leaves the battlefield, those effects are gone. So in a way, the Unicorn is better from a couple of angles. Anyway, it's way better from a price angle. It's a quarter. A gumball. If you are a millionaire, you probably also want Miri Weatherlight Duelist for 20 bucks. Basically, Miri plus Iroas means your whole team's unblockable. They're only allowed to block with one, but everything of yours has menace, so they cannot be blocked. And Miri only costs three, so that means Rocco can bring Miri into play for six mana. Pretty good. You got 12 bucks lying around. How about an Aurelia the War Leader? You do not get an additional main phase in between, so you don't get to bounce Aurelia and cast her again to make her think she's a new one. Well, this is a new one, and it's about 12 bucks as well. This is Clouth Unrivaled Ancient. Well, guess what's a spell? Rocco. Guess what's also a spell? Those white blink spells to put Rocco back into hand. Guess what's also a spell? Rocco, that's back in your hand. If you're getting that much mana, you can probably loop that a few times. Maybe you're using Team or Sabretooth at that point. This card's incredible. I think it's going to get way more expensive too. Not going to dig too deep, but seven bucks Morag Fury of Akum. I mentioned this on a previous Rocco episode, but you're getting extra combat steps for more landfall. So Morag with green, it's a dream come true. 
even primarily focusing on cards that came out like within the last year and a bit, we've still got even more options. Do we go more artifacts or do we not? So let's get back to some more newer cards that I want to add in this kind of thing. Sophia, Spear Sage Deserter, otherwise known as Chief Jim Hopper from Secret Lair Stranger Things. You investigate once for each non-token attacking creature. It's probably going to be quite a few. We're going to put a lot of clues into play at once. Maybe we throw in an Audric Blood Curse. So when Audric enters, you get a bunch of blood tokens where X is the number of abilities from all of them. First strike, double strike, etc, etc, etc. Kadra copies them, Myriad copies them, Duke Alder copies them. Every time an Audric enters, you get a bunch more blood tokens. Or you run second Audric that everyone has all the keywords. That's also very good. But if you're going this blood token clue angle, that's a ton of artifacts. So now Nettle Cyst becomes a very appealing piece of equipment. Equips for two or for zero with Brunor. Last chapter coming up. A combo, another cool stuff to do. Save the best for last, you know, like dessert. I don't see this as much as I thought I would. Toralf, God of Fury, is the four mana god, and he says whenever a creature or planeswalker an opponent controls is dealt excess non-combat damage, Toralf deals the excess damage to any other target other than that permanent. Blasphemous act? That wins games. You drop a Toralf, and then for probably one red, as it always costs, you cast Blasphemous Act. And now, how many opponents do you have? Do they have a bunch of tokens? Because if they have a 1 1, that opponent is taking 12 damage. Or a different opponent is if that opponent only has a few life left. You get to point it wherever you want. And I want to remind you if you're holding that Blasphemous Act in hand, Rocco costs 3, the X is 4, which gets you Toralf. Then you put a Blasphemous Act on the stack. Your opponent's got to do something about it, or that win is in the bag. Speaking of sneaky spells, we also have Sun Forager. It has to be a red or white instant, but we can find a red green instant or a white green instant that costs four or less and cast that for free. What are all the possible things we can cast with Sun Forager if we have access to green? And honestly, there's not a ton of new stuff. Most of it is artifact and enchantment removal with all the charms and things, but that's nothing we couldn't do before with Sun Forager. My favorite ones, though, I think that are a little bit different. Eldamri's Call. Maybe someone has dealt with Rocco a bunch and it would cost way too much. Here's another way to get something into your hand. Signal the clans, kind of similar. We've got a setup where most of these Boros commanders are sort of interchangeable, so we can definitely find three commanders that will do solid work for us. We'll get one of them. Here's one more. I don't know how good it is. It's pretty narrow. Guttural response. Very narrow, but blue decks, they won't see that coming. They will be surprised by it. So how would you put this together? I always say, I'm not going to give you a deck, I'm going to teach you to deck. You know your meta better than anybody. As a rough draft, I think I'd start with the lands, about 34 to 38. Put in your top 6 to 8 attacking legendaries. I'd recommend the ones I talked about in the first chapter. Maybe another 10 or 15 creatures that have good attack synergies, the equip enablers, that sort of thing. Put another 10 to 20 cards that are like ramp spells, ways to protect Rocco, bounce them back to the hand, that sort of thing. I've been keeping loose numbers, but that takes us to about 80 cards. And that still leaves lots of room for you to customize it. What kind of removal do you like and how much? Do you want more draw? Always a good idea. You want to fit in another little extra package, maybe something like an extra combat thing with Marog and Sunforger. I haven't even talked about it, but you could put in a whole gold package too. I'm looking at you, Marisi Breaker of the Coil. If you want to link to all the cards I mentioned this episode, you'll find one in the notes below. And if you purchase any cards whatsoever after going through that link, it does support the show. I appreciate it. Rocco's too cool. I had to do another one. See you next week for a new episode. In the meantime, you keep being you. World's a better place for it. See you next time. And if you're intrigued by Rocco, check out this episode. And then the one right after it. I love Rocco.